science enthusiasts. Welcome to Spaces Unleashed. Every week on Twitter, we bring an expert to chat live through the Spaces program. And this is bonus content that goes with the Science Podcast. We hope you enjoy the show. Dorothy, you're good? You got, a, you got your coffee? Where are you in the world right now? Uh, I'm in uh, Germany, so right now I'm on holiday. I'm in uh, northern, in a very small town, visiting a friend. So you're on um, holidays, and you're getting up at three o'clock in the morning to talk science. You are just you are <laughs> you're passionate about what you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anyway, I don't have to get up early tomorrow morning, so it's occasion. <laughs> are you talking? Are you try? Are are you with a bunch of guests? Are you like in a, a closet somewhere so you don't disturb people? Uh, room and everyone else is asleep <laughs> <laughs> all right so just uh just so everybody knows who who like what you do um you have you were a guest on the science podcast and um i was just fascinated by what you do and what you study could you tell everybody like what what would your title be like what <laughs> what kind of scientist are you so uh, when people ask, I usually present myself as a laser physicist, although this is really only part of what I do. So uh, I, I studied physics. I have a bachelor and master degree in physics, and now I'm working on my PhD, working on ultra cold atoms in a in a laser laboratory in, in at the University of Hanover here in Germany. That's a pretty good title. You're a laser physicist. I would, that's, I mean, that's, that's nothing that's, uh, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> um, have you seen any of the Austin Powers movies? Do you, did you watch those in Germany? <laughs> yeah, I did. Okay. So you like, laser, uh, right? Laser beams and <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. lasers are cool. They are cool. All right. So since you, since you mentioned lasers, why are you using lasers? Like, what's the deal with your, the lasers that you're using in your area of science? So the 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 really cool thing about lasers is that they uh, that they really just use just a single frequency of light. So they really have this one single frequency. So we have a, a special system uh, that, uh, and you need to fulfill a certain resonance condition. So you want to hit a very specific frequency to do a very certain thing with the light. Then lasers are the very best tool to do that. So, uh, for example, in, in my field, uh, we want to excite atoms, and atoms have the um, um, have these resonance conditions, these uh, given by the electronic structure, where if you hit a very very certain frequency of light, you can excite them into a higher state and manipulate them and do cool things with them. And uh, this is what we use lasers for. So resonance is the. Uh how would you describe resonance? Like, I'm just trying to think of an analogy. It's like almost like a special dog whistle that only like if you, if you hit the right pitch of the dog whistle, you can get the dog to do something pretty incredible. Is that kind of the idea? These yeah. Lasers... Exactly. Okay. All right. So these lasers can make the atoms do some pretty amazing stuff. Okay. Exactly. All right. So what is the amazing things? <laughs> what, is, what are you like? What's the amazing thing that you're working towards? with exciting the atoms with lasers? Mm, so uh, in the end, what we do is that uh, actually we use these excitations to cool down the atoms in a very special scheme so that they um, that we get a cloud of atoms that barely doesn't uh, expand at all. And then we can uh, drop this cloud of atoms and measure how fast it falls to so measure the acceleration of the atoms in gravity and with this we can all do, we can do all kinds of basic physics experiments so my question dorothy is just cold are you making them because this is what i find so amazingly interesting yeah so the the temperatures that we're talking about here is so in the end we're talking about something like 100 pico kelvin so that's uh 
uh, yeah, I don't know how to say this in words. It's really barely, really very, very small bit about uh, above the absolute zero temperature. So uh, in Celsius, that's minus 273-ish degrees Celsius. So you're, exactly, yeah. So you're talking, you're getting within like <laughs> nano, like one to times 10 to the nine close to like close to absolute zero does that blow your mind when it gets when you get things that cold when it works yeah it's it's really absolutely amazing i mean you really get a, a cloud of atoms and usually in in uh, normal air any bunch of atoms will just disperse into the room super quickly with something like 300 meters per second and <laughs> At, at room temperature and for these special atoms that we prepare in a special vacuum chamber with really nothing else around that could disturb them uh, we can really watch them expand in the in the course of uh, seconds because their uh, their speed and their temperature is so so small so before i get to the the big question what are some things that happen to stuff to atoms when it gets that cold like, is there some is there some weirdo stuff that happens when things get that cold? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it's a very simple system, so you can observe the the relation between between speed and and temperature uh, when when the atoms get that cold. And then there's this special threshold that we always try to cross, which is case Bose Einstein condensation, which is really a, a different state of matter that we are uh, that we are causing the atoms go uh, to go into and then suddenly they they bunch together in a very weird way and it looks like they are not uh, a million single atoms but suddenly it looks like they're just a big bunch like one big particle moving like uh, like a single particle but with the with the size of uh, of all these millions of atoms Right. So if ever, does there, like I, I was thinking about to try and describe this is in the spaces you see every bubbles, right, Dorothy? We're all atoms. But if we became this condensate, all of our bubbles would meld into one like giant bubble. And we would we wouldn't know that we're not individuals anymore. Right. That, like the atoms kind of forget who they are and they become like a big blob. Um, yeah, exactly. did I get that? Did, did I get that right? Yeah, that's exactly. It. This is also what what makes it really interesting as a uh, to describe as a physicist because it's so much easier to describe the dynamics of a single particle because suddenly all kinds of many particle dynamics just uh, we can just get rid of them in the mathematical description, which is also a really cool uh, cool thing about this. <laughs> I know you're so interested in the physics and I, I just can't wrap my head around like atoms forgetting who they are because I'm, I'm a chemistry guy, right? <laughs> so the big picture question for you is, okay, you're, you're using lasers and they have like a special frequency and it kind of like tricks the atoms down a bit. Oh, why are you doing that? People are going to be like, that's amazing. But what's the, what's the end goal of this kind of research? So there, uh, for these kinds of experiments, there are many, many different applications. So uh, cooling atoms uh, makes them a really good sensor for all kinds of things. So as I said, you can uh, drop them in gravity and then you can make a really, really accurate measurement of what we can do in the end is uh, to make fundamental tests of, of physics, for example, of of gravity. So uh, gravity is a basic concept in physics and there's a lot of descriptions and theories about this and especially there is the Einstein's theory of relativity and uh, this is something that we can actually test with our system we because we can make so accurate measurements of gravity. So um, for example one cornerstone of, uh, of Einstein's theory of relativity is the so-called equivalence principle. And one part of this is the universality of free fall, which, uh, which states that all particles, independent of their composition and what they're made of, will always uh, fall at, at the same rate in a gravitational field. So they will always uh, drop with the same speed in, if they're um, under the same conditions, for example, in vacuum. 
And this is something that we that we can test on a super accurate level with uh, with atoms by cooling two different kinds of atoms at the same time and then dropping them simultaneously. And then we can measure both of the gravitational accelerations and see if we can measure any discrepancy. Wow. Do you, do you feel like sometimes physicists are just, they just keep doing Einstein's homework? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, so, I, or maybe it's a, it's a different way around and, uh, <laughs> Einstein did his homework, and now we're like, there must be a mistake in his homework, but we just haven't <laughs> found it yet. <laughs> we well, know that just, something's just, off. <laughs> he was just proven right about something about black holes. The, like yesterday, our account tweeted it out. And I was like, oh, man, like this guy's been gone for like 60 some years or whatever it's been. He just keeps being right. So there were a few there were a few very early tests of, of what he had proposed. So, for example, Eddington did a few measurements uh, showing that you can actually see the light of stars bend around the sun to uh, change their mm-hmm. path to the gravity of the sun. So this was something that was really done very early after the uh, publication of his uh of his theories, and then again and again, there were more proofs and more um, more measurements to show that uh, he was right in so many different uh, ways. I saw a visualization of gravity, and does it does it apply with your system using the things that are so small that gravity is like a well, like a, a dip, um, like almost like a trampoline that's been pulled down, and that's why things fall in it. Um, does does that visualization work for your line of study? Yes, it does. So this is something you can you can always apply that you don't imagine gravity as a as a force, but you imagine it just as a as a geometric effect where you see that something will be pulled into the well of uh, of a massive object. And I guess if you're an atom, everything is massive to you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, actually, it's, uh, it always depends on, on the product of the two miles. It uh, doesn't matter uh, really how how small you are and how big the other one is. You'd always, I mean, the, the attraction of the Earth towards the atoms is the same as the attraction of the atoms towards the Earth. I, that's so crazy. That's amazing. Now, the system that you've made, when we talked on the podcast, this is this will be kind of my last, uh, I have two more questions, and then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, I thought your system that you guys are building in your lab, your university, is kind of small, but it's not. It's, it's like pretty big, right? Yes, it is. So, um, uh, as with uh, all kinds of measurements, it always makes the measurement more accurate when you make it bigger. So if you can, uh, this is also true for, for classical tests, so easy tests of gravity. If you uh, drop a, a ball over just 10 centimeters, then it will be really hard for you to measure the acceleration because the time is so short and you Every measure, every error you do in the in the time measurements for measuring measuring the the positions will add up, and you will have a, a, a not very accurate measurement. But if you drop something over a hundred meters, for example, then you will get a much more accurate measurement. And that's why we are building a, a ten meter high a vacuum tower for our atoms drop in. So that we can really uh, get to the best possible sensitivity. So ten meters, hey, that's quite a big apparatus. Now, does somebody <laughs> does, uh, is it built like in the staircase, or is that somebody up on a ladder to check the top of it? Actually, um, this was built in a in a special research building. That uh, so it was originally planned to have this experiment in there. And what is what they did is that they have three floors of the building above each other and then there's just a cut out in the corner where the tower goes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it, it, it. And then we were we were when we were planning this uh we were uh so we had a certain height at our disposal and the building was still being set up and then we were like ah, well actually we can't really fit all of the components that we need above and below the 10 meters uh, in so we went to the guy who was planning this and said ah, can we have another meter please 
And then they actually made this possible so that we didn't have to cut down the tube to less than 10 meters. Oh, well, that's good. I mean, it's good you caught it early. It would have been really tough at, tough after. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, my last question before we open it to the floor. You, in your life, have a connection sort of to our family. Your family had a burner as a pet, a Bernice Mountain dog. Can you talk about your, your Bernice Mountain dog that you had in your life? Yeah, he was called Billy, and um, we had him when I was a child. So I think we we decided to get our first family dog when I was uh, 12 years old. And um, we saw an, an advert on, on TV with a really cute kind of dog. And we said, okay, mom, dad, we want that. <laughs> And this was a Bernese mountain dog. And then they actually found a breeder in the region uh, who who was breeding these kinds of dogs. And then we went there with a the whole family and and uh, chose one of them. And uh, yeah, this is how, how we got Billy. He was a really great Aww. dog. <laughs> um, you said on the podcast, there's one member of your family that he listened to the best. I forget who that was. Yeah, that was always my dad. So he was the one giving the commands. And, and if Billy listened, then it was, uh, it was to him. <laughs> uh, if he was being distracted by anything, then he really wouldn't listen to anyone else. I guess we also weren't experts in, in dog training and we didn't do everything right. But uh, this was still quite a good time. <laughs> Our family, Bunsen, listens to me the best, but it, he definitely likes he likes Chris, my wife, more. So I wonder if it was that way with your family. The dad was kind of the boss, and <laughs> yeah. the kids and everybody else, the dog liked best. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, if you just feed the dog, you're, of course, his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. I thought I would just give you some ideas about how you could support the Science Podcast. Number one, you could support us on Patreon. Check out patreon.com backslash Bunsen Burner. There's multiple tiers of support, and the lowest tier of support is not much more than a cup of coffee a month. The second way is you could check out our merch shop. We've worked really hard to partner with clothing companies that do a great job of providing vibrant colors and soft feels. We also have the Beaker Stuffy for sale. It's so cute. The third way you could support us is giving us great reviews on our podcast playing apps. Any kind of review helps. And if you can't find a review, share our podcast with people. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to open up the floor to questions for Dorothy. If you have any questions about her work with lasers, or you were confused maybe about super cold particles, or you have questions about gravity, um, those are some things probably in your wheelhouse. Hey, Dorothy? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, you... Okay. Hey, John, do you have a question? Okay. Hello, how's it going? You have a question for Dorothy? Hi. But yeah, I was just asking, because I know you're obviously a huge Mandalorian fan in Star Wars. Uh, what is the likelihood of uh, like lightsabers or like laser guns becoming a reality uh, in like the future? Yeah, so the, the question of, of lightsabers has, I think, puzzled a lot of physicists. And there have been a lot of ideas and, and calculations how this could be feasible and um I'm not. I'm not really sure how this would be realized in a in a in a physical setup because I think the. I mean the the main thing that uh, bugs me about the existence of lightsabers is that they end somewhere. So I mean the lasers don't just end somewhere in in the middle of the room. They will just they they need some kind of mirror to reflect them and. Uh, so there would need to be some kind of, of structure to reflect the light. So I think this is a bit, uh, maybe a bit unrealistic. Um, maybe for for some kind of laser cannons or, or laser guns, that would be a bit easier because you could just, I mean, there, uh, there are some kind of pulse lasers where you can make really short pulse uh, with really, really high powers. Uh, I, I don't think they're the size that you can just carry around at your at your wrist yet or at your on your belt. But uh, laser guns with pulse lasers might be a thing. Is it the power source, Dorothy? Like you just need a crazy power powerful source to run those crazy powerful lasers? Actually, I. Uh, 
I don't know much about pulse lasers, so they are a very different class of lasers than the ones that I'm using. And there's um, a lot of very special things that they need. And uh, I know that the most powerful pulse lasers are really like filling rooms uh, with uh, all the components that they need in order to make these really, really pulses. But I don't know what the trade-off is, if there can be a semi-powerful laser uh, in a in a much smaller size. Hey, we got computers from room size down to ones that we're all on right now. So maybe there's hope in the future for laser guns. Uh, lasers themselves can be really, really small. So you laser diodes, which are really just like the size of an LED. And then you just need a small housing around that, some temperature control, and then uh, your laser is done. So this is really like uh, is of a few centimeters of size. But I just don't know if this is uh, compatible with a with a high power pulsed <laughs> application, because of course the the power needs to come from somewhere, and this usually takes up some space. John, that was a great question. Glad Dorothy answered a bit of it. Um, go to Liz now. Liz, you have a question. Yeah. So I'm I'm just gonna put it out there. I'm sort of ignorant about all this stuff, despite both my dad and my brother being physics teachers the only thing i remember from physics is f equals ma but um talking about like lasers i like to think about like applications and i don't mean to sound stereotypically girly here but i know they use lasers for like the cool sculpting i don't know if you know what that is like cosmetic surgery and go in and break up like fat cells so is that i don't want to say is that like what you're doing because obviously it's not but like how does something like that work and how does it not damage like the epidermis, but it's messing with like sub Q things? Does that make any sense? Or just you can tell me to shut up. Is that in your area to answer, Dorothy? Lasers that could be used on people? Yeah, I think I can say a few things about this. So, um, I mean, the the really cool thing about lasers is that they can uh, that they can be focused on a really really tight spot. So you you can focus the the power of the laser beam down to a few micrometers or maybe a few 10 micrometers. So this makes it a really versatile tool to make uh, to make detailed work on anything, be it any kind of areas that you want to uh, work on or something on the, on the human body where you want to address just a very single spot on the skin, for example. And um, what you can then do is look at the wavelength of the laser because... Um, Depending on the wavelength, um, the the distance that it will enter into a skin changes because uh, the energy of the of the laser changes, and then uh, depending on the wavelength, it will it will enter at a different depth. So this is something that you also know from from UV light, for example. So if you if you are outside and there's not a lot of UV light, then um, then you will just get some warm feeling on your skin. But once there is a higher UV component in the light, then the light will enter your skin a bit deeper, and then it will um, that it will destroy a few cells and cause sunburn and and maybe uh, in a very uh, a strong case skin cancer or so because the wave is able to enter the um, the skin to a deeper level and uh, these are the effects that that are used when you use lasers for uh, skin and, and medical treatments that's really cool i never even thought of. i know they use lasers for dogs for various ailments that's that that's cool thank you you're welcome great question um, Howie, you're up next. You just have to unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you are <laughs> um, <laughs> around the world. Um, I kind of feel I think maybe uh, Liz accidentally kind of took my question um, uh, just because I know uh, uh, my wife has had to have uh, eye surgery and they use lasers uh, uh, for our retinopathy um, and such. So I was wondering, I guess, how much work do you do? I guess, are you, I guess, in your research, are you working? With I guess I guess the medical profession, uh, kind of taking with what how they have used lasers um, in their field, and then taking what they know to see I guess how much more you can expand on it. Just because I guess I'm kind of like John, I just the idea of like you know lightsabers, laser cannons for good um, uh, use is just it's just mind-boggling just how far. Uh, 
we can go out. I just don't feel like we've like almost like touched the surface of what of the possibilities that can be uh, utilized with this technology. Okay, so um, I'm personally not working with any medical applications. So, so we are our experiment is more focused on on the fundamental physics uh, experiments. Uh, so we are really just. Uh, setting up every laser system to be dedicated for these kinds of measurements, for cooling the atoms and making these fundamental physics measurements. So I personally don't have much uh, much contact with these fields. But of course, um, so sometimes at, at conferences when all kinds of people get together, I've also talked to, um, to people who, for example, use lasers of very similar wavelengths that I use for my, um, for my rubidium atoms. They also I think the um, the lasers that you use for for eye treatment are also at a very similar wavelength. So we um, so we are po uh, it's possible for us to exchange experience these kinds of lasers. But um, I'm not really more in touch with this community. Although of course it's it's really interesting and it's so exciting to see what kind of possibilities there are with these tools. So Dorothy, when you go to conferences, do the laser people group together like do you have like a little laser click at the conferences or no i'm just kidding so actually we uh, we don't visit laser only conferences so much but it's uh, we are more uh, focusing on the atomic physics and quantum physics people so these are the the conferences that we usually attend but of course there are more broad conference include all of this and then we also get to talk to each other and talk about, for example, development of new high power lasers that can make our measurements even better. So there's always a lot of exchange between the fields. That's great. I was slightly teasing you, but I mean, I'm, you, you, did, you were very gracious and you gave us even more information. Um, so thanks. Dr. Nancy, you're up, you're up now. Thank you. I had a question if the, the sub zero, the, the super cold experiments you're doing are, fascinating in the behavior of the atoms. I wondered if doing those experiments on something like the space station, I mean, does that help you get to that super cold temperature more easily? Is there a, is there an application or a, a way that using, doing something in zero gravity that would benefit the experiments that you're doing, that they would be aboard something like the space station? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so um, for, for getting the atoms to the zero temperature, you always have to hold them in some kind of trap uh, in order to not let them fall bef before you're done with the, with the cooling process. And actually, gravity is, is disturbing us there because it deforms the, the traps and the atoms always want to go out of the trap and fall down before we are done. So um, there it actually becomes really interesting to work in, in microgravity and there actually have been a lot of experiments so there are experiments in a in a drop tower where you can where you have a zero g for a few seconds and there has been a rocket flight where they put such an experiment on a on a sounding rocket and had a microgravity for six minutes and and showed that they can reach this both einstein condensation is in space as well and then recently, I think two or three years ago, they also actually launched something on the ISS. So there is a uh, Bose-Einstein condensate on the ISS uh, that they're doing experiments on right now. And we are always working on the next stage of experiments where we can use this for even more tests of fundamental physics and um, use the fact that the atoms just don't drop down. So uh, in in the experiment that I am doing, um, we can extend the free fall time of the atoms by just building a longer tube uh, to let them fall for a few, uh, to have them in free fall for a few seconds. And in space, you just have this state more or less indefinitely because the atoms just don't drop down. So this is a really interesting field of, uh, of, this, of this research. It's interesting. Thank you. What a great question. I never even thought of that. Dorothy, does that mean would you would you hop on a spaceship to go your do your experiment in outer space? <laughs> that would be really cool, but <laughs> I guess the, the way these experiments are designed is actually uh, to to be able to be operated by uh, let's say non experts. So uh, 
normal astronauts on the ISS who are not specialized in this field so that they can uh, uh, exchange parts that don't work or exchange the optical fibers with their astronaut gloves. So this is really part of the design process so that they don't actually need us on the space oh, station. Oh, so you, we, oh. Can you imagine if your title changed to laser specialist on the ISS or something like that? That <laughs> that would be cool. 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 Uh, okay, uh, Rupert, you got the last question. Go ahead. This is actually Cynthia. I forgot I would. I had signed in on the dog's account. Um, so I teach uh, boy, both boys and girls that are about nine to ten years old, and I'm always interested in encouraging my girls to pursue STEM careers. So, Dorothy, I would love to know two things. Number one, how did you get? inspired to go into the STEM field, especially physics? And then part two, what did yours do that would have inspired you or what do you wish they would have done? So just how did you get involved in maybe looking for some advice to inspire my my younger girls to pursue these careers? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very uh, good question because this is also a topic that I often uh, think about and try to improve. So um, I was inspired by uh, by a teacher. So I had this math and physics teacher who was just so enthusiastic about everything he taught. And somehow this this caught me. So this was in, in ninth grade. So I was about uh, uh, 14, 15 years old. And uh, until then, I found science classes quite boring. But then he came along and uh, I actually started being fascinated by mathematics because it was just so logic and it all made sense. And then this uh, this combined with the with the description of the world around us. So I was just fascinated by this uh, by this description. And I don't know if there was anything special that he did. I think he just encouraged everyone. So when he saw that someone was enthusiastic about his topic he he always gave this back and it was like oh it's so cool that you're interested maybe you want to do some extra tasks to get into this or maybe you want to uh, read some more or maybe i can send you to the university to to look at a few classes so he really uh whenever there was some enthusiasm he was interested in amplifying this wherever he could so I think this is the best way to to go. If you see someone that is interested, maybe just a little bit, that shows interest in just a small part, then try to amplify it so that they don't uh, lose this joy again. What a great question. Thanks for asking that. Dorothy, I'm going to let you go. So the questions are are, are done for uh, Dorothy now. If everybody can give Dorothy a 100, uh, this has just been such a great chat. Making something so complicated make sense. Like I, I, it makes sense to me a little bit more. Um, and Dorothy, you're just so inspirational. And uh, I, I can't imagine the like, especially the young girls. If you ever get out to talk to people, you're going to inspire a whole generation of young young physicists. So thank you for being in the space today and talking about. Yeah, thank you for giving the me this opportunity, and also thank you for the for the cool and interesting questions. Always good to hear from people who are actually not from the field and to have different interesting questions. If you want to hear more from Dorothy, she's on the Science Podcast. Thank you so much again.